Hi, are we all here? I think we're just waiting for Bill. There we go. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I guess I will go ahead and get this started then. Um, my name is Amy Caldwell. I'm Associate Editorial Director at Beacon Press, and I'm very, very happy to be here with all of you for this conversation about Andreas Karolas' brand new book. I actually have a copy of it right here. <laughs> Backwards. Uh, climate Courage, How Tackling Climate Change Can Build Community, Transform the Economy, and Bridge the Political Divide in America. Andreas Karolas is the founder and executive director of Revolve, a nonprofit organization that empowers people to help nonprofits in their community to go solar while raising awareness about the benefits of clean energy. He's joined here today by two very distinguished guests. We're so happy to have them, uh, Bill McKibben and Catherine Hayhoe. Bill McKibben, of course, really needs no introduction, uh, especially if you care about climate change. He's the author of numerous books on, a, on an array of subjects, um, but really from one of the first books to sound the alarm about global warming, the end of nature, to his most recent title, title Alter. And he is the founder of the environmental organization, 350.org. Catherine Hayhoe is an atmosphere, atmospheric scientist who specializes in the study of climate change. And she has a lot of uh, fancy titles, which I'm gonna now read to you. She's the political science endowed professor in public policy and public law in the Department of Political Science, a director of the Climate Center, and an associate in the public health program of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at Texas Tech University. She's also the founder and CEO of Atmos Research, which is dedicated to bridging the gap between scientists and stakeholders. Catherine, Bill, welcome, and thank you very much for being here. So here's how we're gonna structure this event. Andreas is gonna read a very short passage from the book, and then I'll ask uh, Bill, Catherine, and Andreas a series of questions based on some of the key ideas in the book, allowing them about 10 minutes to discuss each one. At the end of the hour, we'll have time for a few questions from the audience. Please do write them to us in the Q&A box. Uh, let's get started then. Andreas, take it away. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Amy. And, and um, uh, Amy was the editor for this book and has done uh, just such a tremendous job turning um, you know, my words into what we see on the page. And, uh, and of course, I want to thank everybody at Beacon uh, who did such a phenomenal job um, at making this, uh, making my uh, dream come true here. Um, and of course, thank you to Bill and Catherine uh, for taking the time uh, to join us today. And, 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 and uh, both of them are uh, featured extensively throughout the book, um, understandably given their expertise in the field. So thank you all for joining. And one thing for those of you that are listening, um, Amy, my last name is spelled Corellis. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Carilla, so that's okay. We'll, we'll we'll get it right for the next time. Uh, but uh, great. So let's uh, let's go ahead and kick it off. You know, I think this passage here from the book that I'm about to read um, really tries. I, th I think really sums up what the book is about, um, and it's about realizing that we actually do have uh, an opportunity to come together uh, and solve the climate crisis, um, and that solutions are available and that we actually um, have a little bit more momentum than perhaps we, we might believe. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, and dive into it. Um, this will be a, a brief story time moment from Climate Courage. In today's world, as citizens, we often feel like cogs in a machine. Big companies see us as consumers. Politicians see us as voters. The media sees us as viewers. Our human spirits are yearning for the opposite. We want to be useful and to make an impact with our actions. We want to create things. We want to make decisions that positively impact our lives and our communities. We want to innovate and build and produce content. We want to be makers and doers, not takers and users. And that's what's so exciting about the moment we're living in. To solve climate change, we're going to have to remake the world and reimagine how it works by running countless new experiments. 
we have the opportunity to redesign everything from how we eat to how we get around to how we power our society to how we plan our cities to how we build our buildings to how we interact with each other to how we make a living this is going to require everyone to be creative doers makers and thinkers the times challenge us all to be visionaries exploring the upper limits of humanity's potential. They challenge us to explore how we can create new ways of living that are more in harmony with nature, with each other, and with ourselves. While it may sound like a heavy lift, here's the good news. It's already happening. Despite the efforts of many to keep us stuck in the fossil fuel age, the economics of clean energy, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, smart grids, battery storage, organic farming, and the like are disrupting the current state of technology. As the cost of clean energy technology continue to drop and the fossil fuel industry approaches obsolescence, the question is no longer, how do we create a carbon-free economy? Rather, it is, how can we do so in a way that's seamless, equitable, and fast enough? Thank you for indulging me there <laughs> with a little Great. passage. No, that was wonderful, Andreas. Thank you very much. And Andreas, that passage, I would say, really embodies a central aspect of uh, your book. It's idealistic, but also practical. And it importantly envisions an active role for all of us. We, we are all the doers and the makers and the thinkers who get to reimagine and recreate our world. It's, it's an exciting passage, it's energizing. And uh, that leads, again, nicely to my first question. So one of the things you do early on in Climate Courage is you um, analyze the literature around the psychology of climate change. Uh, climate change is something that we know it's scary, it's upsetting. Uh, often one wants to turn away from the facts it can feel overwhelming. Um, Andreas, uh, Catherine, Bill, I'd love you each to speak to your thoughts on this question of psychology around combating climate change and getting people to listen to the facts out there. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Um, you know, there's been a tremendous amount written about this question. Uh, one of the things that we know um, that's been pointed out many times is that the human brain is really maladapted to respond to the crisis of climate change. And uh, we talk about this at, at length in the book, um, but one analogy that I wanna bring up that I think is, uh, is, is really apt, and, and I use it uh, throughout the book, is this idea of the rider and the elephant. Mm. This was um, an analogy that was uh, written by a psychologist named Jonathan Haid, uh, and then further popularized by the Heath brothers uh, in their book, Switch. And basically it talks about uh, two different parts of our brain. Um, and the easy way to think about it is we have our emotional brain and our rational brain. And our emotional brain um, is the elephant and our rational brain is the rider that sits on top of the elephant. And the issue, and, and so you know, technically what we're talking about is the, the limbic system, which is our emotional part of our brain. That is our uh, sort of a fight or flight mechanism. It's, our, it's where our instincts come from. And that's also where our decisions are made. Um, whereas our rational brain, uh, the rider on top, is the, uh, is the prefrontal cortex. And that's where our planning happens and our long-term thinking and our logic and, and rationality. And so the issue is that these two pieces of the brain uh, or systems of thinking uh, come into conflict quite a bit. And when they do come into conflict, um, you can guess who wins, right? The six ton elephant uh, is really gonna decide which way to go. And the rider on top, despite wanting to steer one way or the other, um, really doesn't uh, have much control over the situation. Uh, a simple analogy to think about this would be your rational brain, the rider decides, okay, we're gonna start eating healthy and get in good shape. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you're at a cafe and there's a cupcake in the window and the elephant says, well, it's cupcake time, right? That's where we're going. And so the rider really doesn't have uh, much control over that anymore, right? I'm sure we all can relate to examples like that in our lives. And so the reason why this comes up with climate change is because 
so often when we communicate about the problem of climate change, we are speaking to the rational side of our mind. We're talking about the science and the facts, and we, uh, we fail to first connect with the emotional side, with the elephant. And the thing about the elephant is that it's skittish and it spooks easily. And if the elephant um, it doesn't feel comfortable, if it doesn't feel like it emotionally resonates with the messenger, or there's something about the message that's, that's scary or overwhelming, elephant wants to bolt and it wants to get out of the room and it doesn't want to stick around and listen to the rest of the talk. And so that's where we need to really be shifting our narrative around climate change to first talk about, to first try to reach someone on an emotional level and then uh, bring in the facts and the figures and try to uh, have a rational conversation. Um, you know, one of the studies that I talk about in the book that was really insightful for me um, from out of George Mason University, and it's 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 counterintuitive. Basically, says if people are given uh, both the facts about climate change as well as uh, point as well as solutions that say here's how we can solve this, and here's how you can get involved. Here is how you can be empowered and have agency in solving it. They are more likely to believe the science and climate change if they're told the science of climate change and they believe that they don't have a way to help solve the problem, if they feel like there is no solution, then they're actually more likely to discount the science, right? And that makes sense, right? We can understand that intuitively. They basically are saying, look, um, here's this really scary problem. It's, it's really overwhelming. And if I can't do anything about it and there's no clear path to solution, I can either sit here and worry about it all day or I can turn away from it. I can ignore it. I can pretend that it's not real. Um, Andres, thank you. That's that's great and a clear explanation. Um, Catherine, can I ask you um, what you think of, of, of that framing of the issue? It makes total sense. So as humans, when we're confronted with a fearful situation, we tend to freeze. It tends to paralyze us. And so much information about climate change is this deluge, this information dump of bad news. All the scientific studies that I do, all the assessments and reports we do, it is just more and more bad news. As humans, if we're confronted with a problem and we don't know what we can do to help fix it, our defense mechanism is simply to reject it and to ignore it. We can't live under the crushing burden of anxiety and stress of some huge problem. There's nothing we can do, we feel like. But if we know that we can do something, if we know that having a simple conversation about why it matters, about what we can do to fix it, about what people are doing around the US and around the world already to fix it, which the book Climate Courage is full of great stories and great examples you can share. If knowing that even just simply doing that can make a difference, then all of a sudden we feel like, oh, well, there's something I can do about it. So that makes me part of the solution, not part of the problem. Catherine, thank you so much. Um, Bill, what do you think? Well, first of all, what I think is, it's really a pleasure to be here. Many thanks to Beacon, which over the years has produced so, so, so many important books on the environment, most recently this one. And, and many, many thanks, Andreas, for getting it all done. And what a pleasure, as always, to get to be with Catherine. Uh, who is uh, non pareil in her ability to talk and think about all of this. Look, I, I think that there's always been an agency problem with climate change. It's the biggest thing that's ever happened on the planet, at least in human history. And we all seem very small next to it. So it is reasonable to feel uh, like I can't really do anything about this and hence I should move on to some problem that I have some hope of overcoming. And I think that's why it's been, I think that's why it's important to offer people uh, all kinds of things that they can do. Um, I also think that it's important for us to realize that people have good built-in nonsense detectors too, and that they realize when the things that we're doing aren't actually big enough to make a difference. Um, telling people to go change their light bulbs seems to me as likely to be counterproductive as productive. And so I think it's been very useful. One of the best things about the growth of movements uh, over the last decade 
whether it's 350.org or Fridays for the Future or Extinction Rebellion or Sunrise Movement or anything like that, is that they seem to me increasingly to offer a kind of plausible possibility for people engaging at a level that it's that it begins to make emotional sense that you might make a difference. So I often say to people that perhaps the most important thing you can do as an individual is be a little less of an individual and mm -hmm. join together with others in movements large enough to have some ability to change the political or economic ground rules, which at this point is the only way that we can, I think, successfully deal with the challenge that we're in. Um, it's important not to get too uh, uh, doomed out about everything, um, but it's also important to acknowledge that we've already raised the temperature of the planet one degree Celsius. We're not going back on that. Even if we do everything right from this point, it's going to take some lucky breaks from physics and chemistry to keep us under two degrees. And in fact, we're headed toward three or four degrees. And if we do, then we're not going to be able to have civilizations like the ones we're used to. That's not scary or alarmist. That's just, you know, how the math works out. So our job is to figure out how to arrest that at the lowest possible point. And we have to be mature enough to understand that there's no, at this point, no preventing global warming. Um, um, but there is uh, an enormous amount we can do in the next few years, emphasis on few, to make sure that it doesn't get any worse than it has to get. And that's the most inspiring and powerful role that humans maybe have gotten to play yet on this planet. That's a really good way of putting it, Phil. Um, and so that's kind of a more uh, level, an approach that wants to take in the gravity of the situation without letting it become paralytic. Um, let me switch to yet another, to a very different topic. Um, Andreas, one of the other things you do in Climate Courage is you take a look back at the history of climate politics from the 1960s to today. Um, and you show that certainly surprisingly to I think many in the audience, there's actually been a long history of Republican support for climate solutions. Can you tell us something about what has caused the divide around climate change in more recent years and how we might hope to bridge that? Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, thanks, Catherine and, and Bill, for the great um, uh, conversation so far. And I think one of the things that to me is so important when we think about what, what can we do over the next few years uh, to mobilize and to uh, enact solutions as quickly as possible is we need to bridge the divide and we need to bring people together to the table um, in a way that we're all working uh, towards solutions that we're all sort of rowing the boat in the same direction. And so <clears throat> I spend a decent amount of time in the book looking at uh, Republican and conservative views on climate change and why do we have this narrative that this is a sort of polarizing issue when, um, when in fact the history shows that uh, there's actually been a tremendous amount of support. Um, so, you know, if you if you think about, uh, you know, one of the things that I talk about is that every uh, Republican president or presidential nominee since George H. W. Bush has at some point acknowledged the reality of climate change. Uh, even Donald Trump, um, before he was president, uh, took out an ad in the New York Times in 2009. Uh, urging President Obama to uh, take decisive action on climate change uh, at Copenhagen. And so, um, and so that's actually surprising to a lot of folks is that there's actually been this consistent acknowledgement of the science um, you know, from the very beginning. Um, you know, George H.W. Bush famously said, um, you know, for those of you that are afraid of the greenhouse effect, um, you know, remember the White House effect. Uh, and, and basically, you know, and then went to the United Nations um, and signed you know, the, the Rio uh, Earth Declaration in 1992, right? And so you have in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So, so there's actually been this, and of course, you know, going back, um, you know, to the EPA and uh, uh, Richard Nixon and, and, and all of these folks who have, um, that when climate change, when preserving the environment was not uh, the, the political divisive issue that it is. And so you have to look at what has happened since then. Um, you know, certainly, 
Um, LBJ has a report put on his desk in 1965 uh, that lays out uh, this is what the top climate scientists think is happening. And they pretty accurately describe exactly what was uh, going to happen and, and has happened. Um, the fossil fuel industry also had their climate scientists uh, looking at the problem from that time, um, very much aware of what was going to happen. Um, you know, in fact, Bill points out um, that, you know, in uh, that they were actually building their oil rigs taller because they knew that sea level rise was going to come and affect it. And at the same time, while they had that information and they had those climate scientists internally, uh, they were presenting a very different uh, false misleading narrative uh, to the public. They spent um, all this money hiring consultants, uh, the same consultants that the tobacco industry used to sow doubt about the health of cigarettes. Um, they used those same consultants to, uh, to, to misinform Americans. Um, and they also put a lot of money into politics and, uh, and swayed uh, politicians to uh, create this sense of there's this doubt. And so, uh, so that's where we've sort of seen the politics sort of break down over the last uh, few decades. And, and we tend to think that there's this, uh, that, that, that it's totally polarized. But actually, when you look at the data, um, now Americans are actually uh, closer to uh, coming together on climate change than they've ever been. Um, you know, you see 73% uh, uh, of Americans uh, believe that climate change is happening. 62% believe uh, th correctly that it is caused by humans. Uh, but most importantly is you have 85% of Americans who agree on the solutions, i.e. 100% renewable energy uh, in America is supported by 85% of Americans. I say this all the time. Um, how many things do 85% of Americans agree on right now, right? So the fact that we all across party lines agree that 100% renewable energy um, is something that we want to uh, pursue um, is something that we need to be telling over and over again. That narrative needs to be made more popular. And look, it's not surprising why so many people are in favor of renewable energy. The cost of renewable energy is continuing to come down. It's saving people money. It's creating jobs. We, we currently have three times as many people employed in the clean energy sector than we do in fossil fuels. And clean energy only amounts for 11% of current energy mix. So think about the job creation that lays out for us in the future. And so you know, what I talk about in the book, I think the way that we can challenge this narrative that we've been told uh, by politicians and by the media that we're so polarized around this um, is actually by telling stories and showing those unlikely climate heroes on both sides of the aisle. Um, so I talk about uh, Dale Ross, who's the mayor of Georgetown, Texas, um, you know, who uh, Georgetown, Texas is now the uh, is 100% powered by clean energy and he's a staunch Republican. They are the second city in America to go 100% renewable energy. Uh, we talk about the Pope um, and and the climate encyclical that he put out. We talk about uh, the New York Yankees and their commitment to sustainability. Uh, we look at Las Vegas and how MGM and the 13 casinos that they own, uh, you know, now own the, the largest contiguous rooftop solar installation in the country. Um, and so all of that uh, is, 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 I think, how we go about changing that narrative. And I guess one other thing I'll, I'll mention on this is uh, former uh, Congressman from South Carolina, Bob Inglis, uh, who I, I have a section on in the book, you know, he says that really the, one of the, the issues, and again, this goes back to the rider and the elephant, is when, you know, he has this great quote, he says, um, what happens when, when, when the left is talking to the right about these issues is it seems like it's coming across as, we know better than you do, you're a bunch of hicks from the sticks, we're so much smarter than you are, We've got scientists who tell us this and that. We'll design a regulatory system that will fix things because we can't trust you to make good decisions. That's one way it comes across and it's offensive to conservatives. And so to me, that is just a very humbling perspective, right? I think we so often are trying to educate folks, trying to teach them something. And he's basically saying, look, um, let's sit down and have a conversation that's not you telling us something and making us feel um, sort of Offended in this way that he's describing, and so um, those are just some of the themes that I think are really important as we think about how do we how do we try to bring people together um, towards solutions moving forward. Thank you, Andreas. Um, 
Catherine, I'll, I'll go to you again. How well, would you I respond? Really, yes. I really think that what Bill said was important, that one of the most important things we as individuals can do is be less of an individual. And one of the sections in the book that is so important is the focus on groups that we often don't think about are supporting climate change. So I serve as the science advisor for young evangelicals for climate action. There are more than 20,000 of these motivated young people around the whole US who are advocating for climate action and clean energy in their city, in their state, and at the federal level. There's the Evangelical Environmental Network. There's the Catholic uh, Covenant. There is um, uh, Interfaith Power and Light. There are all kinds of faith-based groups all the way across the spectrum. There are green Muslim groups. There are interfaith groups. There are Catholic and Protestant groups. There are Buddhist and Hindu groups connecting over something that we share, building community with people whose values are part of our values too. And then acting together can be so powerful because often we feel inadequate ourselves. We feel like I can't do anything. And then we feel like even if I did do something, it wouldn't make a difference. But if we are able to act with people together and we see the power of this in the children's climate strikes, don't we? then we see that we can make a difference. And in fact, I think we can change the world. And, you know, I would say it's interesting. A lot of the stories, Andreas, you tell and some of the folks you mentioned, Catherine, I think those are definitely underreported um, groups that are involved in combating climate change in the media. And, it, and I certainly agree. It's um, stories that we need to hear repeated more often in terms of changing the narrative. Bill, what would, what would you say? Well, well, first of all, Catherine's so right. One of the great pleasures over the last 30 years has been getting to kind of play a small role in the, in the development of this kind of religious environmental movement uh, across a variety of faiths and traditions. And I think it's potent and powerful. That said, I think it's important not to underestimate the degree to which there is conflict in these systems. And you can't just talk your way around it. I mean, look, uh, Bob Inglis is a great guy, but he got voted out of Congress the minute he started talking about climate change in a Republican primary. One of our political parties is more or less owned by the fossil fuel industry and has been for quite a while at a deeper level that goes right to what Catherine was talking about, about individualism. I think it's really important to remember that we still all kind of live our live political lives in the shadow of Ronald Reagan, who taught us that markets solve all problems and that government is the problem, not the solution. I mean, Reagan's most famous laugh line was always the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Ha ha ha. It turns out that that isn't. I mean, the scariest words in the English language are, we've run out of ventilators or the hillside behind your house just caught on fire, okay? And neither of those yield to market solutions or anything else. So while we, when we get people together in these good groups, then we've got to go after the people in power who don't want to change things. And we've been able to do that with increasing success. For instance, this fossil fuel divestment movement that has united lots of people working in faith traditions, say uh, from the Pope on down, to lots of people on academic uh, institutions, many of the biggest, most important colleges in the world, uh, uh, and lots of others. And now has become the biggest corporate campaign in history. We're at $15 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have uh, moved out of fossil fuel. Shell Oil said last year that it had become a material risk to their business. And that's a good thing because Shell's business is a material risk to the planet. So it's really important for us to recognize on the one hand that it's going to take all kinds of people to do this work, but on the other hand, understand that those all kinds of people, when they come together, are going to have to stand up against some powerful forces that want to keep us doing business the way we're doing it at the moment. And, and physics and chemistry just let us know that that's not an option. So we have to figure out how to be spokesmen for, in some sense, for, for physical and chemical reality going forward. Yeah, and to, and to learn to, to communicate that well. Um, 
So to go on to the next question, um, and we, we've touched on this a bit, but I was going to ask you a bit about bright spots in the climate fight. I mean, and you know, it feels a little ironic asking this question because Andreas, I know you're in the West Coast. We talked a couple of weeks ago and you turned around, you turned your laptop around and showed me the fires outside your window. Um, as we know, the, the fires that have been uh, decimating um, California, the Pacific Northwest, uh, are related to climate change. There are also clim uh, huge fires in South America, as we know last year, Australia. So this is a global issue. Um, we've also been hearing lately about really some... Every year, I think we hear bad news about the polar ice caps. There's more bad news this year. Um, so this is the tough stuff. Um, what are some bright spots? Um, and maybe also some bright spots and solutions that uh, focus on inclusivity uh, within the climate movement. Yeah, well, um, well, I'll just start and I'll say, you know, thank you, Bill, for, uh, for pointing out, yeah, that this is, uh, we can't negotiate with, with physics. And, uh, you know, I, I opened the book um, with, with one of your quotes, Bill, basically saying that this is a time test, right? Like we don't have forever to solve this. We have to solve this right away. Um, once the door closes on that opportunity, then it's gone forever. And, and so I think that's why this is such an interesting question because it's, we need to figure out how do we come together in such a short amount of time? And that is a very uh, difficult question to answer. There's, and, and that's why uh, you know, so much of the book talks about the psychology of how we as individuals think about climate change and how we, and, and psychologically, how do we come together as a group to get past our differences, right? To collaborate and to cooperate um, in the short amount of time that we have. Because, uh, you know, the idea that, oh, you know, we can just solve this on our own, um, you know, without uh, sort of group support is, 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 is faulty. We have to, we, this has to be a group support. Uh, this has to be a group effort. We have to get everybody on board. And so we have to find that commonality in order to do that. Um, and so, you know, one of the, actually another, uh, Think, Bill. I was recently flipping through uh, Falter, and you know, one of the things that you write that I think speaks to a, a big portion of the book is that we have two technologies that, uh, if employed, could be decisive to the era, and those are the solar panel and the nonviolent movement, right? And and feel feel free to elaborate on that. But um, you know, and and so actually, you know, one of the big pieces of the book uh, talks about that. I mean, I obviously work in solar uh, revolve. The nonprofit organization that I founded, uh, we finance solar energy projects for nonprofits that otherwise couldn't go solar. And we do so because those nonprofits can then uh, reduce their electricity costs, benefit uh, the people who they serve even more so, um, and also demonstrate to the community the benefits of solar energy. And so one of the things I think we have in the fight against climate change that's on our side is the fact that solar energy is contagious. What do I mean by that? When someone goes solar, uh, their neighbor is more likely to go solar and their neighbor is even more likely to go solar. And we've seen this play out in communities around the country. This happens over and over and over again. You can see it on a map, clusters of people going solar. And so, um, and to tie this to the equity piece, uh, there was a great study that came out of Tufts and UC Berkeley about a year or so ago. And they talked about the disparity, uh, the racial and ethnic disparity of solar installations in those communities. And what they found, um, not surprisingly, um, although uh, alarmingly, is that communities of color, particularly African-American communities, uh, have much less solar, uh, even after you account for wealth disparity. So it is absolutely a, a racial and ethnic disparity. And but what the study also found uh, is the solution uh, that they see, that they point to, is what they called um, seed projects. And these seed projects basically build off of the idea that solar is contagious. And in fact, if you put solar uh, in a community uh, that otherwise doesn't, uh, in, in a community of color or African-American community uh, primarily, the adoption rates are even faster. The solar contagious effect is even higher, dramatically so, uh, than it is compared to other communities. And so that is super powerful, right? It means that um, 
you know, we as communities uh, look to our neighbors to see how we can solve this thing. And if we see other people taking action, uh, we want to take those same actions um, and those can spread. And so you know, one of the things that we talk about in the book is we look at, again, you know, these two technologies, the solar panel and the, non, the nonviolent movement. Um, we look at a lot of the nonprofit organizations, the community groups that are solving this problem. Um, you know, to touch back on, on something, you know, earlier we were talking about agency and empowerment. The climate movement, in my opinion, and this is frankly the reason why I started Revolve, it's the reason why I wrote this book. The climate movement has often painted one of two areas for engagement. One is, like Bill mentioned, uh, you know, changing your light bulbs and, you know, taking the sort of individual actions. And, and like you said, we have a detector that says that's probably not going to cut it. Right. I can, you know, bring a reusable tote bag, but that's not going to stop the spewing of carbon into the atmosphere from the companies that are doing it. And so, and while that's super important, right, our individual actions are 100% super important. The other side looks at, well, what can our leaders do for us? What can our, what can the federal government do? And as somebody who's been in this fight for a long time and, and being with people here who have been in it much longer than I, I'm sure we all know that none of us are holding our breath waiting for the federal government to solve this, right? Um, and so, you know, we send petitions and we sign letters and we send them to our Congress folks, but we, but, we don't, um, but we don't necessarily think that that's the only way that's going to happen, as important as that is. And so between those, what I see as the, the, the way to engage people that they can feel agency is at the community level. What can we do with our neighbors? What can we do in our cities, in our counties? Um, that can actually have an impact, that can demonstrate the benefits uh, of sustainability, and thus, like a seed project, have this contagious effect from one community to the next, right? And so that's one of the things that we, we talk about a decent amount in the book. Um, you know, some examples, for example, the, the Sierra Club has their Ready for 100 campaign. Uh, and the Sierra Club, obviously, you know, the oldest and you know, one of the most influential organizations in the country, has basically trained volunteers to say, uh, go to your community, go to your local city and, and county and convince them to commit to 100% renewable energy. And this campaign uh, in just a few short years has been so successful that now we have one out of every three Americans lives in a city or county or state that is committed to 100% renewable energy, right? So that's the power of community. And of course, you know, Bill mentioned the, the divestment movement. Right, I mean, uh, this you know, fifteen trillion dollars, which is what it's communities, it's it's college students going to their universities, it's congregation members going to their house of worship, it's uh, pension members going to the pension fund managers and saying, hey, look, this is what we want to do, and that's it's not coming from the government, it's not coming from you know your individual actions at home, it's coming from communities coming together around solutions. Thanks, Andreas. Um, Bill, would you like to take it away from there? Well, I think that that's, I mean, I think that what Andreas is saying is absolutely right. Um, and, and I do think that there are things that should give us um, plenty of reason to be optimistic, uh, or if not optimistic, at least not to be giving up. Um, you know, we've watched over the last year or so, a kind of real sea change um, in the way that say the uh, that Wall Street thinks about carbon and climate, and it's happened because lots of people have gotten together and pushed, and it's also happened because uh, you know uh, solar power and wind power are now the cheapest way to generate electricity, and that causes your spreadsheet to start you know blinking amber uh, in alert. Um, and between that, uh, you know the the way that money gets allocated and things like that has has begun to shift. And I think that Andreas is very right to caution us that Washington is not the only place that counts, um, that there are lots of possibilities. But I think that the, the, the part about coming together um, to do this is really, really important. And there's been some good coming together even in the course of this horrible year. You know, the most important thing anyone has said in 2020 was what George Floyd said as he was being murdered. He said, I can't breathe. And there's lots of reasons people can't breathe. They can't breathe because there is a cop kneeling on their neck or because police brutality stifles their community. 
Often in the very same communities, people can't breathe because there's a coal-fired power plant down the street. We know enough about the uh, uh, effects even of COVID to understand that it follows lines of, of race and class vulnerability too. People can't breathe because the wildfire smoke gets so thick that you know the authorities tell people to shape to tape shut their windows and stay inside people can't breathe because it gets too damn hot we saw the hottest temperature ever reliably recorded on our planet this summer 130 degrees in california it was 120 degrees in san luis obispo which is pretty much on the pacific ocean that really shouldn't be possible but it is now and and so we have the possibility for a commonality that we have not felt before, or at least not for a while in this overly divided nation and in this overly divided world. And that commonality is a commonality of, of vulnerability um, uh, as well as of possibility. Uh, and we are at this moment when the engineers have given us the gift of technologies that could be transformative if applied quickly and at scale. And so our job is to make sure that we create the conditions for that to happen. And that's why what Andreas is talking about is so important and why it's so possible right now. Had this book come out 10 years ago, it would have been whistling past the graveyard because we wouldn't have had in place the possibility for solutions at scale. But since we now do, it makes enormous sense to be having precisely this conversation. Well, thank you. Catherine, what would you add? Absolutely. People often ask, and I've even seen a few questions in the chat, how do we talk about this when there's so many other issues in this world today that's right up in our face? Um, there's injustice, there is poverty, there is inequity, there is inability to supply the physical needs of our family and put food on the table. Right here at home, as well as around the world, everybody is struggling right now. And the reason we care about climate change is not because it increases the average temperature of the planet by one or two or three or even five degrees. It's because climate change is the great threat multiplier. It takes everything we already care about today and it makes it worse. So it increases the risk of health impacts. It increases the area burned by wildfires. It makes our hurricanes stronger and much more devastating. It increases the risks of extreme heat, which of course hit the poorest first. If you look at every basic goal to reduce poverty, eliminate hunger, ensure people have clean water to drink, make sure that we just have stable systems where people can go to school and can go to the doctor. All of those basic things are threatened by climate change. So what I say to people is who you already are is the perfect person to care. In fact, you already do. It isn't a case of moving climate change up your priority list and displacing something else. The only reason you care about climate change is because items one, two, three, four, five, all the way down to the end of the things on your priority list are being affected by climate change. And that is why every single one of us cares. That is so beautifully put. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Thank you. Um, you know, I think I'm going to go. We have 31 questions in the Q&A. We won't get to all of them, but we are at 448. So I think I'm going to go right to some of the questions now. Um, and thank you, folks, for um, sending in so many questions. Um, let's see. Um, from Greg Komen, I know Dr. Hayhoe supports a carbon fee and dividend as a powerful solution to climate change. Do others agree? Bill, well, <laughs> whoever wants to jump in. I mean, I was I'm actually writing about this for this New Yorker climate newsletter that I do that's out tomorrow. I mean, for a long time, uh, price on carbon was considered the kind of sine qua non uh, policy recommendation. And there's no intellectual reason not to have it. There's no reason that the fossil fuel industry should get to pour its waste into the atmosphere for free, just treat it like an open sewer. Um, I think probably that the, a lot of the, um, uh, I think that, that increasingly there's a policy, that there's a consensus emerging that at the very least, a price on carbon isn't going to be able to do this job by itself, in part because we've waited so long that uh, to, to get 
cuts of the scale we're now needing, you'd need an implausibly high price on carbon in order to make it happen. And so I think the question will come, uh, assuming that there's a Congress at some point that actually wants to do something about climate change, um, what you trade away in order to get something else. And, I, I, you know, clearly the oil industry, if it was going to accept a price on carbon, is going to want to be freed from threats of litigation and regulation in return. And at this point, that seems like that might be a pretty high price to pay. It may be worth remembering that it was precisely those threats of litigation that's what eventually moved the tobacco industry uh, uh, to, to some kind of capitulation. Very good point. Yeah, and I, I would just add, um, you know, we actually, I, I write about the, the carbon dividend framework in the book, um, not taking a policy stance, but pointing out that there is a strong uh, network of uh, conservatives who support the carbon dividend framework. And then also pointing to um, the framers, the authors of the Green New Deal, uh, also, you know, pointing out that in the Green New Deal, there is actually um, a lot of room for uh, mechanisms within which you would achieve the results of the Green New Deal, the carbon dividend framework being a potential, right? And so, you know, rather than, you know, me outlining, you know, there are a lot, um, a lot of people who have a lot more insights into how to frame the best, uh, you know, carbon or climate policy than I do. Um, and so I don't take a stance on that in the book. Uh, more, I just say that there are opportunities uh, for bringing together both sides and there are opportunities for moving forward. Um, and frankly, I think, uh, and this, of course, you know, came out after uh, the book, but, you know, Joe Biden put together this incredible clean energy plan um, that he's, you know, talking about moving forward, which is talking about $2 trillion invested in, in infrastructure and clean energy technology um, that'll, you know, create, you know, 5 million jobs uh, that will, um, you know, do all these incredible things for the economy that, that we need. And I think that, uh, I think there are there are plenty of policy solutions that uh, can get people together that are in line with the science uh, and that, that get people excited. Um, so I think there's a lot of room there for uh, for working out the details by by smart people who know how to do that. Great, thanks so much. Let me um, go for one more question. Um, this is from Jay Powell. How do we educate, motivate, and mobilize people within their community? as a collection of neighborhoods to advocate and ensure that we build a community-based and directed solar and storage microgrids that develop the potential within those communities to become energy independent and ensure equitable participation. Um, then he's saying versus, um, I guess, our kind of traditional dependence on imported or remotely controlled energy systems. Andreas, this seems right up your alley. Yeah, no, I'll, yeah, I'll take a crack at this. So, I mean, I think, uh, well, first, uh, you know, first of all, you know, at Revolve, um, you know, we've installed, we've financed uh, over a megawatt of solar panels uh, for nonprofits in 13 states around the country. Um, and, uh, and we are now increasingly, you know, the thing that we get uh, asked all the time is, can we add storage to that? Um, and so we're now putting together storage for some of the projects that we're working in. Um, you know, I will say, I just, uh, just saw an email, a great partner of ours is a group called the Clean Coalition. And they just recently put together a proposal uh, to create a microgrid in uh, Goleta in, in Santa Barbara. And uh, basically you have an entire, uh, the unified school district in Santa Barbara. And forgive me if I don't get all the details correctly, but basically the school district has agreed to create a microgrid with storage um, that's solar powered, right? Now, what I will say is that they are at the very leading edge of this, right? This isn't a very, um, you know, this isn't super commonly done. Um, and so there's a lot of things that we need to figure out in order to deploy microgrids at scale. You know, one of the things I talk about is that in Puerto Rico, in, in the book, in Climate Courage, after Hurricane Maria, the entire electrical grid on the island of Puerto Rico was devastated, right? Uh, there was, there's nothing left of it. And so, you know, one of the things that was exciting is that first of all, uh, Puerto Rico decided that we are going to commit to rebuilding that uh, one, as a 100% renewable energy grid. And it's going to be a microgrid that's, uh, it's going to be based on a series of microgrids um, in sections that are uh, what they call mini grids, right? And so there's a lot of technical innovation that's happening here. And that's the type of 
example that we can look to and point to and say, okay, how is that happening there? How can we implement that elsewhere? Um, and I'll say this as well, the costs are continuing to come down, right? As electric vehicle, you know, we just saw in California, um, you know, Gavin Newsom uh, called for uh, now to be law that by 2035, uh, only emissions free vehicles are gonna be sold in California. So we're going to see a lot of investment dollars going into electric vehicles, and batteries, and the costs are gonna to continue to come down. And as that happens, uh, we're going to see the, the idea of microgrids that are able to island, especially in the face of storms and fires and all the increasing uh, impacts of climate change that require us uh, to be more resilient. Um, these technologies are gonna become much more available and, uh, and we're going to see it happen all over the place. Right. Um, let me go to another question since we have so many, um, and maybe this is one uh, you can answer, Catherine. Um, this is from Teresa Shader. What organizations are actually consulting, implementing the work at the systemic level beyond the individual, light bulb changers, and beyond education? One that comes to my mind is Rocky Mountain Institute. Well, I would actually say the first that comes to my mind is what Andreas does, right? <laughs> exactly. So there are all kinds of organizations. And I think maybe in just, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but maybe in just one minute, if you could explain what you do, I think that would be super helpful for people. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Revolve uh, is a nonprofit. And as I mentioned, we finance solar. You know, one of the things that uh, we see in the solar industry is that if you're a homeowner, you can go solar and save money right away. And if you're a big business, you can do the same. And the folks that are left out are actually the small to medium scale nonprofits across the country. And there's a whole host of reasons why, but these are the community institutions uh, that benefit uh, people. These are homeless shelters, schools, uh, places of worship, um, uh, food banks, uh, health clinics, right? Places that people really depend on. Um, and these are places that uh, oftentimes they recognize the threat of climate change on the vulnerable populations that they serve. So they wanna be doing their part in solving the climate crisis. And yet the financing for solar for them is unavailable. And so Revolve is a nonprofit that has come up with a unique model of how we finance those projects using a revolving fund. So basically we've you know, raised money originally from crowdfunding donations. Um, we've now partnered with investors and we put that money into these nonprofits uh, that otherwise couldn't get financing they go solar, they tell the story uh, to the world, and they're able to provide even more benefits to their community members as a result. And each project that we build actually pays into this revolving fund, which then helps to pay for more and more solar projects for other nonprofits around the country. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for maybe just one last question. And I, I do wanna say we have so many smart questions here and, I, and I'm sorry we, we can't get to them all, but it's, um, it's really wonderful and impressive and great to see how engaged and knowledgeable people are. Um, this is from Mike B. Please comment on the interaction slash benefit of local action, say at the city slash school level versus actions at the state and national level. Can cities slash schools, oh, sorry, this moved, et cetera, be models for broader action at the state and national level? And um, I, does anyone feel like they are particularly well suited to addressing that one? So I work with cities a lot. I specifically look at how cities can prepare for the impacts of a changing climate because even if we do everything we can, some impacts are already here today and some additional impacts are inevitable because of what we've done. It's like we've been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for years. We don't have lung cancer and we're not dead, but there is already some impact on our lungs. So I work with cities and I do that half of it, but almost every city I work with pairs that building resilience with cutting their carbon emissions. And cities can often act much more quickly than states or countries. The city of Houston, which is home to most of the large oil and gas corporations in the United States, just announced last week that they will be meeting their Paris Agreement goals, they will be going carbon neutral, they will be adapting for and preparing for the impacts of a changing climate. And if Houston, one of the largest cities in America, and again, the home to companies like Exxon and Chevron, if they can do it, who can't? Well. That's, that's a great story and also an enormous driving city, as we all know, too, right? Um, yeah, that's a, uh, Catherine's exactly right, and that is a beautiful example. I mean, truthfully, this is going to take coordination at 
every level to have any hope of making it work. At the global level, I think we're beginning to understand that the Paris Accords, though they didn't actually produce great promises from countries about what they were going to do, did actually give us a great gift in the set of targets around 1.5 degrees. And that's, um, that's changed the ball game in a lot of ways by finally giving the rest of the world a measuring stick to figure out whether what they're doing is comes close to being useful or not. And so now, you know, we, I mean, look, the four of the five largest economies in the world in the last week or two have put forward pretty big plans, Japan, the EU, China, and California. Um, that leaves a fairly large hole <laughs> shaped like the rest of the United States. But of course, we get to have something to say about that on November 3rd, you know. Um, and then we have all this work that can be done at state and, and local levels. None of this, you know, things like building microgrids and stuff are really hard work. And they're not, we, we, this is not going to happen if it's all just a kind of endless collection of DIY projects you know, sprung one after another across the country. You know, we need to be pushing, we, we, we need lawmakers forcing utilities to do the right thing and, you know, on and on and on. Um, but we now are beginning to compile this set of examples, this set of benchmarks, this set of people who are committed to action. Um, and that may be, well, look, I mean, we wasted 30 years. We wasted 30 years largely thanks, as Andreas explained, to the oil industry lying to us about this situation. So we've got to cram the work of four decades into one decade. And that is going to be really hard. Uh, and it's on the bleeding edge of the technically possible to even quite imagine. But that's what we have to do. We don't get, you know, physics is not going to cut us a break because we wasted time, you know. Um, and it's not grading us on a curve. And so that's what we're going to have to do. And it's why these examples are so important. They give us heart as we go into what is the single biggest battle that humans have had to engage in yet. So I'm enormously grateful to this book and to Andreas. And of course, I'm endlessly grateful to Catherine every single day, um, who is really, really showing what can be done. So good on you all. Yeah, and I'll just, uh, you know, echo that and, and first of all say yes, you know, first of all, obviously both of you, um, uh, you know, I, Joe, Bill, I sent a, an email to my uh, my grad program last night and, and, you know, got a ton of emails back and basically, I mean, we, your books were basically the backbone of the syllabus, right? Um, you know, back when I was in grad school 12 years ago um, and, and Catherine, you know, your work, um, and your, dis your, your easy way to describe the fact that uh, we can get people to care about climate change by connecting the dots um, between what they already care about and the science um, has had a dramatic impact on me. And, 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 it, and you can see it throughout the book. Um, both of your voices are so uh, clear. And there's one thing that I want to, um, you know, kind of tie this to, uh, you know, to kind of end on, because I think we're obviously going through such a dramatic moment in history, uh, a painful moment in history. And, and what that, and, and, and while these sort of look at the things around us and, and there's this massive breakdown on so many levels, what that does is it creates an opportunity to, to rebuild and redesign and reimagine um, something new. And so, um, you know, I, I end the book, uh, I start the, start the last chapter with a, with a quote from Gus Speth, who was another environmental hero of mine. And, and he says, look, if, if today's, uh, paraphrasing, if today's growth in capitalism um, and sort of the consumerist lifestyle that we live were, were making us really happy, then it would be very difficult for us to make the big changes that we need. But if what we actually see, um, you know, and, and the way he puts it is, if what we actually have is a spiritual hunger in an age of plenty, then there's large space for hope. And so what I think he means by that is when we're looking at America, you know, America, despite being the wealthiest country in the world, uh, we're number 18 on the level on the happiness list. Uh, and so we actually have a lot of 
despair. There are diseases of despair. There's a pandemic that's it's called the diseases of despair or loneliness um, or depression. Um, there's so much higher than many other places. And I think it speaks to the fact that uh, we are, this is a time that's ripe for change, not just, you know, what energy powers our roof, uh, you know, powering our appliances, but, uh, but how we approach life, how we approach our communities. And so, you know, in my uh, sort of humble offering in the book is, is what I think of as um, shifting our orientation and our perspective towards gratitude, simplicity, and service. And, you know, gratitude being, look, you know, uh, how can we be more grateful for the things that we already have in our lives? Simplicity, how can we um, focus less on the material and uh, the, the running around and how can we uh, sort of take more time uh, to be with ourselves and with our communities um, and the people we love? And service, right? I think, you know, all the all the great heroes that we look up to from Gandhi to Dr. King would say, um, it's when we're serving others that we actually feel the most fulfilled and the most uh, at peace uh, and the most uh, happy, really, right? And so that's, I think, you know, especially coming out of this pandemic, of course, the pandemic happened after the book was finished, so it's not really able to be in there. Um, but I think, I think that now is a time for change and reimagining so many of these things. Um, and hopefully we can sort of take a look at our values. What are the key values that we really want to be putting forward into uh, as we rebuild and, and reimagine. Andres, thank you. That's a, that's a beautiful note to close on. Um, Bill, Catherine, thank you both so much. Andreas, thank you. Climate Courage is the book. And um, November 3rd, let's get out there, folks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.